welcome everyone. We're going to get started. Um, welcome back from spring break uh, and welcome back to the auditorium. Um, I won't say much. Uh, what I will say is we're very pleased to have Keller back here. Uh, I think you were here a few years ago. Um, so it's a pleasure. And I won't say anything more because Felicity Scott is an old friend of Keller's and she will make a proper introduction. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. So I just actually want to begin by saying that I was very excited when I saw uh, Keller's name on the poster at the beginning of the semester. And, um, and I, it's really an honor to be in the position of welcoming you and, um, and introducing your work, uh, albeit somewhat briefly, um, uh, prior to um, your presentation of the lecture, which is entitled Disposition. And I just wanted to say that Keller's contribution, I think, is really unparalleled in uh, the field of architecture, not only uh, in its content, which as you probably know is incredibly wide ranging, but in the manner in which she uh, deploys what, as you'll see, is a really sort of intense uh, intelligence uh, and a formidable research capacity that we might say often sort of tracks the money, you know, the monetary mechanisms and other political and geopolitical log logistics to unstitch the relations between what she calls spatial products and, and techniques of power. And she does this, again, as you'll see, with this incredible rhetorical elegance uh, and a sense of irony or wit that, um, such that I think one often finds oneself uh, in the middle of the most bizarre situations and casts of characters, yeah, pirates and uh, fools, etc., while experiencing a genuine epiphany about the field, yeah, the field of, of architecture. Uh, and in general terms, I guess we might say that, that she works um, at the nexus of, of architecture, you know, of architecture and logistics, of organization, and certainly at the sort of sites of, of switching, uh, as, as, as we find them in, um, uh, in infrastructural networks, and again, networks both material and, as I'll mention, sort of informatic. And so, for instance, just to, to talk about this nexus, uh, she has referred to the Depression era FAH House as a protocol for formatting the land, a protocol that interfaces, of course, with the banking system and the labor system uh, in the service of private capital. And so all of this together is what Keller would call infrastructure, yeah, in a sense. Um, uh, infrastructure then understood as underlying techniques of political organization. So Keller is currently an associate professor um, of architecture at Yale University, where she's taught since 1998 both in the studio curriculum and also in the history uh, and theory of architecture and urbanism, uh, as well as what we uh, know as globalization or in, in color as rhetoric really sort of globalization space. Prior to that, she was a faculty member here at Columbia where she played a, a foundational and really crucial role in the school's digital turn in the, in the rise of, of the so-called paperless studio, uh, which Keller was teaching as early as 94, I think. Uh, and so I just wanted to say that then what this means is that while Keller was you know, teaching um, and writing on computers and experimenting with digital networks and formats, uh, some of us, uh, like myself, were still like learning how to use Pine. And for those of you who aren't my age, Pine was an email program uh, <laughs> with an incredibly um, uh, basic interface. Also really uh, that early, she produced a Laserdisc project um, called Call at Home, the house and private enterprise, that, that private enterprise built with a, a filmmaker, Richard Prellinger. Uh, but what I want to insist on, certainly in regard to the paperless studio and, and the digital turn, is that, that what she brought to that field, uh, certainly at that moment, but also um, uh, something that continues in her work today, uh, is a decidedly sort of political mode of analysis, one that, that situates ethical and political questioning as absolutely central to what the architect does or, or might do. So then Keller's accomplishments, yeah, awards, public lectures, exhibitions, um, uh, et cetera, are far too numerous, of course, to outline here. So I just wanted to briefly mention um, uh, her major books, and we could also mention that she's a practicing architect with her own um, office here in the city, and beyond that, even an accomplished playwright, yeah, this is uh, incredible. Um, so in 2005, MIT Press published Enduring Innocence, subtitled Global Architecture and Its Political Masquerades, uh, a story in six parts which uh, suggests that architecture might take on a very different type of, of political imagination. It looks, in her words, to 
cite her website actually, it looks at the political misadventures of spatial products, the Teflon formulas for resorts, ports, retail, IT campuses, and other enclave formations, amongst which we might add golf, um, uh, golf courses, um, mm -mm, that store, as she puts it, yes, store, like sort of materialize a very crafty political disposition. Um, acquiring myths, desires, and symbolic capital. Uh, they may be objects of desire and contention in negotiations between warring countries, messy democracies, and violent, distended uh, conflict. And just to give you a sense of the, the texture uh, of that book, there's one chapter um, called El Legido, I don't know how you pronounce that in Spanish, um, uh, uh, a chapter about Spanish greenhouse agripoles that deals with questions of labor, of migration between southern Spain and North Africa, obviously questions of food, energy, alternative energy, yeah, and really maps the, the spatial politics of high tech agriculture uh, in the context of, of migrant workers. Uh, another chapter called I Love DPRK uh, investigates Hyundai's uh, cruise ship tourist resort at Mount Kumgang uh, in North Korea. Yeah? So that uh, sort of incredible uh, body of research. And so it's a body of research that tracks what she calls um, outlaw spatial products. Yeah? Enclaves really deployed as political pawns uh, in jurisdictional battles is the sort of overall formula. What I wanted to say then is that if the, the golf courses, the malls, the, the touristic sites, uh, these sites of agribusiness, might initially seem to be a, a sort of degraded material or material rightfully relegated to the realm uh, outside of, of architecture, as uh, in her words, unresponsive to recognized systems of architectural language, what Keller recognizes in them are uh, incredibly important lessons for, for the discipline, lessons certainly about global politics and its manifestation in a certain typology. So that's to say that if they seem to lie outside the, the codes and institutions of architectural practice proper, they nevertheless give rise to legible dispositions, hence I imagine the title of her lecture tonight, or organizations, so that is they sort of provide evidence um, of the discipline's relation uh, to power and hence also uh, sort of insist on opening potential tactical uh, spaces, uh, spaces to practice in sort of otherwise. Uh, I just mentioned very briefly in 1999, MIT published her organization space, Landscapes, Highways, and Houses in America, uh, a project obviously based in a different geographical location and with an uh, entirely different cast of characters. We find Benton McKay, uh, sort of incredible research on mid-century environmentalism, wow. people like Gregory Bateson, the interstate highway system, uh, all uh, speaking to new spatial or sort of new, uh, properly uh, speaking, I guess, a new sort of organizational logic. And so I'm going to stop here, um, but just to say, I could, of course, go on. and and. I just wanted to finish by saying that if I were to characterize Keller's work and her contribution in the briefest possible way, I would say that what she does is sort of forges new concepts, yeah, and with them new potential strategies for the field, for the field of architecture, in a way that I think we should all take very, very seriously. So welcome, Keller, and we look forward to your lecture tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Felicity. Um, well, a lecture is always a dialogue to some extent, but, but here uh, in this room where there's so many people I admire, it's a dialogue that I truly enjoy. Um, so, uh, my brothers and my sisters, um, the, this evening I, I wanted to offer a contemplation about recent research on global infrastructure as a medium of polity. But I also wanted to contemplate with you um, the ways in which infrastructure studies tutor other artistic and political faculties, uh, an expanded repertoire for form making and activism. Infrastructure in this research includes not only physical networks made of concrete or, or microwaves, uh, for transportation or communication, for instance, but, but also those shared protocols of technology, urbanism, and markets that format global exchanges and spatial products, the management styles, the routines of logistics, the global regulating standards, the, the shared operating system. Infrastructure space is often treated as a binding medium or 
the current between objects that do have form, name, law, or, or as the word suggests, infrastructure is often regarded as a substrate that's beneath, somehow hidden, rather than expressed as positive form. Yet, yet far from being hidden, some infrastructural formations press into view a hyperbolic cartoon of their abstract technical uh, and economic logics. If, if infrastructure uh, includes repeatable formulas for global urbanism, the spatial products are free zones that manifest in gigantic world city formations. These infrastructures are not hidden within another urban structure. They, they are the urban structure. And, and some of the most radical changes to the globalizing world are being written not in the language of law and diplomacy, but rather in the spatial infrastructural manifest of architecture and urbanism. And it's generating forms of polity faster than official political channels can, can legislate them. Then, you know, whether hidden or overt, on an international scale, the, the parliaments that determine everything from free zone logistics to credit card thickness to microwave densities or, or the locations for submarine cables at the bottom of the sea are obscure and at a remove from more familiar legislative process. So these sometimes mundane, sometimes surprising infrastructures become a medium of extra state polity tied to massive global systems administered by mixtures of public and private cohorts a wilder mongrel than any storied leviathan for which we have a studied political response. So the book I'm working on now, titled Extra State Craft, is a portmanteau that suggests outside of and in addition to the state, Extra State Craft tries to sift through the thickening layers of governance that far from superseding the state, often reinforce it with new powers and proxies. So for us, you know, weary of the tediums of the rhetorical or bored with the extent of our influence or bored with our parochial disciplinary knowledge that an alternative to a stale uh, selection of theory is a stale approach to the real. Uh, it's, it's exciting to find in this material for me a refreshed theoretical palette. Study of these socio-technical, that we would call, call them socio-technical networks, draws us into a field that falls between the social sciences, the arts, business, uh, history of science, and architecture. And it returns evidence of a cable zone, standards, et cetera, with which we need to deal. But it, but it also offers other artistic seductions, other strata of political instrumentality. Artistically, infrastructure studies might tutor aesthetic practices with active forms and dispositions, and, and politically, they tutor the census that, that takes advantage of these powerful, sometimes discrepant forms within broad foundational transformation, sea changes, matrix spaces. Infrastructure stories sometimes organize history and sometimes remain the ghost of histories. Within the dominant epistemes, infrastructure is often theorized in terms of nation building, militarization, universal rationalization or cosmopolitanism. Infrastructure has been trained to reinforce the cults of Clausewitz or trained to demonstrate uh, some elementary particle in political or economic science or seen to be the very material to rationalize a shared platform of governance. So we expect the right story and political dissent has, has shaped oppositional stances against those very histories. And, and both frequently assume monistic or binary structures, the monism of ultimates and utopias, or the binaries of enemies and innocents and in combative face-off. And this goes perfect with, with the dramatic swagger we assume when we approach a political architecture you know, something that's sort of themed to be political, that goes to borders and battlegrounds and barricades, surrounded by the heraldry and theme music of empire, multitude, and total war. And in this way, structurally, the grand strategies and, and of the left and the right even share a kind of structural resemblance. Um, in a zero-hour statement come 
Gilbert and Sullivan lyric, we can hear Aurelia saying, I, I am read seriously by the French military. And the activist repertoire customarily relies on, among other things, resistance, refusal, and charitable volunteerism, accompanied by tragic arias of collusion or co-optation, end games of activism often foreclose on the very change it wishes to instigate. Meanwhile, power escapes. F finding the loophole to those end games, power simply wanders away from the bull's eye or, or wriggles out to take shelter in another ruse. Change rarely follows sanctioned plot lines, but rather often pivots around phantom turning points that aren't so easily taxonomized or moralized within orthodox political logics. Beyond our well-rehearsed political scripts and recognized forms of sovereignty are events that may not have an orthodox political pedigree, but nevertheless create a shift in sentiment or a cessation of violence or a turn in economic fortunes. And, and the notion that there is a proper forthright realm of political negotiation usually acts as the perfect camouflage for these truly consequential circumstances and proxies. We expect the right story when it's often the wrong story, the unlikely story, a little epidemic of rumor and duplicity that, that really rules the world. Goliath finds a way to pose as David or multiple forces assembling and shape-shifting um, with even more, um, uh, replace the fantasy Goliath of monolithic capital or corporate culture with even more insidious moving targets and dissent is left shaking its fist at an, at an effigy or curing its failures with another purification ritual or making of the opponent an even more mystical or vaporous er force of, of, of capital and empire, neoliberalism. And even you know, distracted by the pyrotechnics of war, the dramatic pyrotechnics of war, we miss other stealthier forms of violence. We miss the other consequential politics that are somehow happening over our shoulder. So there, you know, there's a time to stand up and give it a name. Uh, um, and uh, as they say, um, and the, the pure and right should be allowed to remain undisturbed and perpetually right. But we might become the clandestine, perhaps even unwelcome auxiliary of this forthright activism at moments when it needs an expanded repertoire or when it might be better not to keep pushing too hard on an open door. A trapdoor out of these epic or tragic narratives is found in the very evidence they deny. While in common parlance, the census is often used to describe the opposite of consensus and a condition that needs remedy, Rancière has used the word positively as the opposite of institutional isomorphism. The census considers the contradictions to consensus, insists on what's considered inadmissible. And as Extra state craft offers some inadmissible, some evidence that inadmissible to some cults of history and some notions of dissent proper, and I hope opens on to a fresh pasture in which to work. Um, in the case of infrastructure, this fresh pasture is always all around us, and we already know it. It's really only an altered habit of mind that makes it available to us. After all, it's a it's a world where Walmart, the most egregious offender with regard to health care coverage of its employees, reappears as the purveyor of digitized health records. Uh, a world where you can't smoke a cigarette but you can buy a gun. A world in which building envelopes inflate and deflate like currency, while we, you know, in the main are still uh, training to create fermitas and delight. A world where some of the most sophisticated high-speed rail projects are being uh, um, tried in the Middle East at the epicenter of oil. A world where the Tea Party movement is successful um, and thrillingly, where Rod Blagojevich, a man with nothing in his hand, is still playing. These inversions and outlying political evidence with their fickle, maybe underexplored logics excite feelings of resourcefulness and ingenuity within the political imagination. Here is a large field of mongrel events and category leftovers, butterflies that aren't pinned to the board because they don't reinforce our 
customary political scripts work. They reset our custom narratives. We find there actually surprisingly, you know, rather than tense resistance and competition, rather than head-to-head -head binary stances, some of those are alternative techniques may ironically rely on just the opposite. The power of gifts, exaggerated compliance, rumor, misdirection, comedy, distraction, contagion, like pandas. Think of the pandas that China offered to Taiwan, named Tuan Tuan and Yuan Yuan, names which when translated meant unity. Um, the panda is the steamroller, sweetness and kindness. It's the means of controlling and leveraging others while appearing to be chirpy and sweet. Anything but the ten script of resistance at the margins is supposed to be collusion with the center, capitulation, but consider exaggerated compliance. Think of the moment in Domination and the Arts of Resistance when James C. Scott draws attention to a portion of Milan Kundera as the joke uh, in which the prisoners in the story are challenged to a relay race against the camp guards, and of course they're supposed to lose. The prisoners decide to run very slowly against the sprinting guards while wildly cheering each other on in this elaborate pantomime. And their, their compliance brings them together in an act of defiance that doesn't diminish or tax their energies with competition and fighting. Of course, exaggerated compliance could disarm, can deliver independence from authority, um, just as comedy can deliver critique while distracting and diffusing tension. Francois Roche's dusty relief was designed to be to electrostatically attract dust from the polluted air in Bangkok until it became an adorably flocked fuzzball. And neither pollution nor prescription are named, as they would be in the sort of not so funny jokes of postmodern architecture. No, there's only a sort of hapless, self deprecating activity that fosters sympathetic resourcefulness and enthusiasm. But it's never very smart to try to describe why something is funny. <laughs> it's why we should pause in the pasture. Uh, to recognize that all these things, pandas and Blagojevich's and right-wing tactics are significant, not because of what they declare, their name, their ostensive content, but because uh, of activity that manages to evade name, declaration, reckoning. It's not what's being said, but how it's playing. It's the spin. It's the English on the ball. These are active forms that possess disposition. Spaces are rarely considered to possess disposition. Um, and, and the notion of active forms would to many seem almost oxymoronic. Um, a building, a landscape interior might be described in terms of its appearance, geometrical composition, visual pattern. Spaces are considered to be objects, volumes, not actors or a with agency uh, or temperament. Disposition as it's considered in philosophy and the social sciences and aesthetic really only tells us what we already know. The word flourishes in common parlance and usually describes an unfolding uh, understanding of temperament or relative position or tendency, uh, propensity in either beings or objects. Francois Julien gives the example of of a ball on an inclined, a round ball on an inclined plane, as a, as a situation possessing disposition, a propensity associated with the factors, with factors including geometry and position. And we might consider this an active form. If, act, if asked to create active form, as we said, it's, it would be oxymoronic to some, and, and for designers, Designers might naturally rely on what they're best trained to create, a, a formal object that's themed or choreographed or dressed up to represent action. Um, we might use geometry to immobilize a process like relativity or embryology or the diagram um, with choreographed, serialized geometric patterns. Uh, and, or, you know, in grasping for the uh, apprehensive and of an evolving spatial field with changing components, the architect designs the field in its entirety um, with a fixed architectural pattern. 
And the more, um, the more uh, complex or agitated these tracings, the more active the form is intended to be. Um, and a still more simple-minded confusion, made more powerful by being simple-minded, would associate action with movement or dynamism. But disposition locates activity not in movement but in relationship or relative position. The ball doesn't have to roll down the hill to have disposition. A glass is brittle without being shattered. Disposition never has to create a verifiable event. That's, that's the point. Um, while you couldn't describe the disposition of the moving cars in this slide, it's the active form eminent in the concrete that really interests us. The physical objects in spatial arrangement and infrastructure, static as they may be, possess agency and disposition. Ordinary language philosopher Gilbert Ryle delighted in these confusions that arose between nominative and infinitive, the, the, the exact mistakes that, that an architect would make when thinking about active form. Um, between, as he says, knowing that and knowing how, um, he, he also knew it was not smart to try to describe what is funny. He said, you cannot ask a question like, what is funny? Um, funny is knowing how, not knowing that. Um, the clown or the, or the comedian is not providing the right answer to what is funny. Um, he, he modulates fluid and, and plastic expressions in relation to the reactions of the audience. What's funny is contingent on a set of possible pathways and choices. From, from Ryle to Irving Goffman to Latour, uh, those who discuss active forms inevitably, you know, in, in their course, their writing, inevitably return to performance to advance their argument. It, it be, you know, because it's, it is one of those arts that's up to its elbows in action when it sets out to work. And has long since naturalized working with the infinitive and the nominative together. Um, in theater, the actor loves the rhythm, the sound, uh, the content of the text, just as the architect takes pleasure in geometric contour. Um, but the actor also takes pleasure in manipulating both the content of the text together with what the character is doing. And rarely relying on text alone, the actor does not play in the nominative. You don't go on stage and play being a mother. Um, you, you, do, you can't. Um, you, you play in the infinitive. You play smothering the child. You play some infinitive expression. So disposition is also not about aesthetics as the connoisseurship of the object in its profile or affect. It, it adds to those pleasures associated with shape and contour, the pleasures and seductions of active forms, of, of, of ramifying effects and behaviors associated with making, making action, making relationship. And since, since there is here, I don't know, so, so, something akin to the, the juicy piece of meat uh, that distracts the watchdog of the mind that McLuhan talked about, I suppose a, a sister aphorism of the medium is the message, we could say the action is the form. Uh, st stumbling further into the pasture, we consider contagions or, or multipliers. Active forms not at odds with, but but rather it propels, expands the power of form as object. The designer of active forms is designing the delta, uh, the means by which an organization changes, not, not the field in its entirety, but the way the field is inflected, the way an alteration multiplies across a field or reconditions a population or generates a network. So while perhaps intensely involved, with material, with geometry, all those things we have in our hands, active forms are, are inclusive of but not limited to enclosure and may move beyond a conventional architectural site. But to, to, to form as content, object, outline, active form adds modes of authorship with time-released powers and cascading effects. You know, the, the entrepreneur knows how to make active forms. Um, while an artist or an architect or a former may wish to author uh, an attributable object that reveals their soul and, uh, and alters the world with a permanently useful and memorable object, uh, the entrepreneur does exactly the opposite. The entrepreneur working with active forms um, wonders 
what the other person wants uh, and how to get them to have changeable desires that supersede and refresh and reverse the products and plans he introduces into a, a population, Walmart health records. Um, so, so here is a sort of a common art for shaping the object as well as the way the object plays, the shape of the game piece as well as its repertoire. The disposition is, is one of the means by which forms become infrastructural, ground changing, matrix changing, game changing, carriers of aesthetic practices, political trajectories that may even be located at a remove in space and time. Consider the double. Further tutoring and expanded political repertoire, these active forms are capable of embodying discrepancies and slippery, undeclared forms of power. Action is discrepant. Rancière describes how Flaubert's Madame Bovary uh, relayed to its audience liberating disposition despite its roots in conservative politics. It was the content of the story. It wasn't the content of the story, but the way the story was written, what the story was doing that communicated. And, and Rancière makes a distinction between aesthetics that concern what is being depicted versus what is being done. Um, I mentioned Irving Goffman, soci sociologist Irving Goffman uses the word disposition to describe the entire performance, the, the spoken words, gestures, postures, facial expressions that we all use in presenting ourselves. Um, he noted that in these myriad subtexts often overwhelm what's actually being stated. The actor knows that too. The actor knows they're not only just playing the mother, they're not enacting a text. They may speak the line, I love you, um, uh, while, while playing an action or intention to murder with that love. Levittown House may be called colonial, although its real composition is unrelated to that name. Bill Bow may be a panda, an underexploited panda. But the double is an extremely useful form of discrepancy. For instance, again with gratitude to the right wing for their instruction, the Tea Party protest is a double. A mirroring of the left, you know, using epithets uh, like of the left, you know, like fascist to describe Obama. The double has magical powers. A word used to identify power amassed through fear and hatred is able to instigate fear and hatred, while it defangs the term in its previous usage and, and inoculates the, the present user. It's an active form, it's dispositional. It doesn't matter what's being said, but what it's doing. Um, Extra state craft drops down into one nexus of urban infrastructure, that's a double, the zone. Free trade zones, export processing zones, specialty economic zones are among scores of zone variants. They're typically a switching point in global trade, um, a space of exemption from taxes, from labor or environmental rela um, regulation. But the zone has been breeding promiscuously with many other enclave campus or park formats until it has become a double. The zone is an ancient form, um, heir to ancient pirate enclaves, the free ports of the Hanseats or the Easterlings. I, these are my people, the Easterlings who are uh, regional sort of free trade crooks. Um, then 1934, uh, emulating uh, free port laws in Hamburg, the US established foreign trade zone status just for ports and warehouses related to trade, kind of you know, warehouses with cyclone fences around them. But as the zone merged with manufacturing, export processing zones appeared in the 50s and 60s, um, like the Maquiadoras, China's special economic zones, allowing for an even broader range of market activity emerged in the 70s. And the zone now merges with offshore facilities, tourist, compounds, knowledge villages, IT campuses, cultural institutions, more and more programs and spatial products thrive in this legal lacunae and political quarantine until the zone has become a paradigm of a new world city. Uh, on the Dubai, Singapore, Hong Kong model, it's offering the clean slate one-stop entry into a foreign country. Um, and special zones of various types have grown ex exponentially, so from a handful in mid-century to a few hundred by the end of the 20th century, to many thousands now. 
uh, operating in 130 countries, employing an num enormous number of people. There are now 66 different names for different co legal cocktails of zone. Some are a few hectares in size. Some are hundreds of kilometers in size. Moreover, in, in a sort of beautiful example of extra state craft, the nation is now engineering its own zone double. National capitals have their own zone doppelganger or shadow city. Um, so the zone that used to look like this, or this, or this, um, has become a city with a full complement of programs. A place where petrodollars get away to relax. Um, Navi Mumbai is the double of Mumbai. Um, Qaddafi's Misirata free zone doubles Tripoli in a site of, of actually ancient Venetian trading. Um, New Songdo city is a double of Seoul in the Inchong free trade zone. Um, the free zone Astana as a replacement of the capital of Almaty and Kazakhstan is in a move sort of surpassing irony, the zone as the national capital itself. So because of the impossibility of reconciling the legal entity residing in the space of exemption from laws, it, it floats free, uh, un unencumbered from reconciliation and truth. It's, it's sort of protected in, in an oscillation between identities. We should have tea parties. But of course, this is the power of meaninglessness and irrationality. Um, and enduring innocence set about to look at these highly rationalized spatial products that as they became more rationalized, became better vessels of rituals and irrationalities. And it found this fuzzy religiosity in golf courses and cream puffs and kingdoms. Um, global infrastructures too are, are supposed to be the great rationalizers of exchange. Think of Saint-Simon's belief that the railroad would create a form of global governance, or Arthur C. Clarke's proposal for global governance with satellite TV. But those proposals also filled with the same confounding false logics and dropout between projected program and reality. From organization studies, another discipline which infrastructure, with which infrastructure studies intersects, John Meyer writes, global society is a rationalized world but not exactly what one would call a rational one. The extra state craft also drops down into the infrastructure of international and transnational organizations that are supposed to be enacting this rationalizing process. Their numbers have been accelerating in um, post-World War II Pax Americana, you know, from, from those moments of the creation of the World Bank, the IMF, the OECD, and those kinds of organization, but, but further ballooning in the late 20th century proliferation of NGOs, INGOs, IGOs, and nonprofit organizations of all types. So from you know, several hundred at, at mid-century to 35,000 today, or maybe um, double that. Um, many are headquartered in UN-style assemblies in Geneva, uh, a Vatican of sorts for international organization. But a peculiar parliament of this, consistent, of this consensus is ISO, uh, the International Organization for Standardization. Founded in 47, ISO is a meta-organization. It's an organization of organizations and a crossroad for the exchanges of, of many, most of these international organizations. After World War II, ISO convened many national standards organizations that they had just been ensuring consistency in munitions in the First and Second World War. And they develop and certify adherence to thousands of technical standards. So they ensure that credit cards are 0.76 millimeters thick um, and slide through any slot. And they, they ensure that screw threads, the pitch of screw threads, um, or dashboard pictograms, uh, battery life and size, uh, ball bearings, footwear, lubricants, internet protocols, they, they work on all of that and have um, for these many decades, um, seemingly innocuous, deadly boring. Um, 
But Iso's real dreams of, uh, of universalization reside in the incantations of something called quality. And it's why the ubiquitous phone voice promises that your call will be monitored for quality assurance purposes. Quality has a history. Um, quality control inspections in the factory, you know, at some point began to evolve to address quality assurance or customer satisfaction. So what quality is, is an isomorphic management style. It can be applied to anything from a restaurant to an automobile manufacturer. Introduced in 1987, the ISO 9000 series, that's the name of the, the quality standards, are the most popular series. And they're taken up all around the world to lubricate transactions in both business and governance. Here's a, a, a global cloud of certified adherence to ISO 9000. And ISO 9000 is really just a very short, non-specific, tautological list of statements about customer focus or leadership or people's people processes, systems approaches, that kind of thing, summarized with the acronym PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act, which is not to be confused with P-O-D-S-C-O-R-B, P-O-C-C-C, C-W-Q-C, C-S-S-B-B, and other scores of acronyms that are part of this quality culture. The management gurus in the US, like Peter Drucker or Edward Deming or Joseph Duran, influenced the, uh, 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 the improvement of post-war uh, uh, Japanese production techniques in the 70s. And when Europe and the United States finally awoke to that, they began to import Japanese versions of quality, now more spiritualized mandalas of, of management, known as total quality management. New sets of principles and mandalas and mottos and charismatic leaders continually emerge. This is Six Sigma, a set of quality techniques that Motorola developed and shared in 1988. You can be a, you can be a certified black belt in Six Sigma. Um, but standards are also becoming soft law. For instance, the European Union has encouraged the adoption of, of ISO 9000 uh, guidelines as a condition with, of, of entry, as a condition of trade policies. And since ISO believes that quality is the universal form, it's based its environmental standards not on, on technical benchmarks for emissions, but rather on the ISO 14000 series, which is a management um, that encourages attitude shifting, sort of, um, and among their, their first initiatives was massaging thought about the way buildings should be built. So a car company can be ISO 14,000 certified. You see, you, you get the picture. Um, like so much of the ISO speak, it's not what the form is saying, but, but what it's doing. Um, this is the, this is the um, UAE quality mark. Quality management standards that motivate so much of industry have more recently expanded their marketplace space to serve healthcare, education, and government. So you're in a hospital, you see pyramids all over the hospital that are about excellence. Uh, you hear the provost talking about excellence and action plans. And these same inspirational gurus are whispering advice to the governments, not of just corporations, but of countries. So in another double, the makers of extra state craft are also managing government procedures, um, conflating customers and citizens. Government agencies hire uh, quality engineers. Presidents hire quality engineers. Um, quality standards join what John Myers called a modern binge of organization, and the, the sort of organization as religion phenomenon. But this is the beautiful Babbitt-esque nonsense that um, at the center of not only corporations but governments, but it excites the political imagination. Consider matrix change. In matrix change, you don't square up to every weed in the field, you change the chemistry of the soil. Um, extra statecraft drops down into networks of mobile telephony and tangles of fiber optics at the bottom of the sea. Um, and through it, we can trace a much longer history of, of cabling, for instance, um, 
that extends back to coaxial cable and telegraph cable. And the story is ill-fitting within nation-building histories of infrastructure or totalizing conceptions of infrastructure and militarization. Massive global infrastructures were you know, really to such a large degree the result of not just national competition and war, but independent multinational enterprises, uh, like the US rail at the end of the 19th century, the largest business enterprise in the world for several decades, employed three times as many workers as in the US military, and incubated, really incubated the managerial culture from which ISO derives. Or it's the same, similar with, with telegraph cabling, a similar enterprise with massive global reach. And coaxial and, and fiber follow many of the same roots as tele, the coaxial and fiber that followed, that are also laying in the, in, the, in the bottom of the sea, followed many of the same roots as the telegraph. But if we look at the new explosive growth of communication technologies uh, since satellite and fiber, within and, and from the point of view of, say, the non-aligned countries where so much of this explosive growth is happening, um, there's much to be learned. And there may be no better place to sample this network of fiber optics than, and, than to look at the last place on Earth to get fiber optic submarine cable, East Africa. And here I'm looking at Kenya. This is Nairobi, English speaking, 40% unemployment. In the last few years, Kenya has gone from having no fiber optic cable to having three cables. Teams and CECOM just came online in June and July. Easy just landed in South Africa about a month ago. But until recently, they've been relying on satellite broadband that's not only inadequate, but it costs 20 to 40 times what it does in other parts of the world. So what, you know, what costs you um, $20 is costing hundreds of dollars. Fed up with negotiations with the World Bank and NEPAD of the African Union, Kenya made its own deal with Etisalat of the UAE, and Teams was the first cable to arrive. And the history is too protracted to talk about now, uh, but, but basically the, the, the disputes were over whether the cable would be open access, something we still don't have in the United States today. Um, and the cable will stretch along the road from Mombasa to Nairobi, um, uh, supporting not only new forms of urbanism, but new forms of agriculture. And it, it's going along very well-worn paths, like a stretch of Cecil Rhodes Cape to Cairo railway that you see pictured here. And not only the UAE, but also China and many ISPs and mobile telephony entrepreneurs are poised. Um, other op op entrepreneurs have been laying fiber along the Mombasa-Nairobi corridor in the hopes of growing export processing zones and calling centers. Dr. Ndemo, the minister who managed the team's deal, wants to spread fiber deeper into the villages. So that's the, that's the, the, the map he would like to see. And along the Mombasa-Nairobi road are already zones. But zones have been breeding so promiscuously in the world that sometimes they favor their recessive traits. In Kenya, the zone doesn't prohibit labor unions. It promotes labor unions. It becomes the place of labor organization in a kind of anti-zone. And ISO will be there certifying to the world that uh, these are zones that are ready, ready for, for business. But what form will this matrix change take? If the zone might be bred to be its opposite, how might it further change? How, how do you get your hands on it? Um, instruments like Google Trader in Tanzania, um, you maybe have heard of it, and it's an online marketplace that allows farmers to bargain with a little more foreknowledge before they go to market. Um, they will be, you know, not themselves enclosures or urbanisms or urbanism or spaces of urbanism or landscape, but they will be active forms that generate those physical forms. So how do we use them uh, in, in inflect them with our expertise about space and volume? Just to the north in Khartoum, in Sudan, on the confluence of the White and Blue Nile, the Almagran developments developed with the friends, with the help of our friends from the UAE will offer 1,600 acres of sort of zonal world city that is the very thing that 
exacerbates violence between the North and the South. Um, so we, it, it goes without saying, it's in some ways entirely obvious, but the notion of disposition stretches to address agency or temperament. These spaces and networks can be evaluated for the ways in which their, their patency, their closure, their position, their arrangement possesses, for instance, a quotient of aggression, submission, exclusivity. Um, it's a whole other hour of hours discussion, but this position is imminent in organization. But finally, contemplate rumor. Um, the right wing instructs us further about the active form of rumor. For instance, the rumor that that Obama was Muslim was brilliant precisely because it was wrong uh, and easy to disprove. It was repeated twice, uh, as, uh, twice as often, first to spread the rumor and then to refute it. Uh, the hoax that global warming was a hoax was again sort of brilliant doubling. So inspired by, by brilliance like this, um, some true stories, researchers in the field of Flexible Truth, it was an exhibition at the Storefront for Art and Architecture in the fall of 2008, rehearsed the design of active forms. Um, in this case, um, the confidence game of design as it moves through and persuades culture. The material presented was partially true. Um, what in Hollywood is known as faction or fiction couched in a context of facts. But different from the work of some uh, fellow travelers in the world of hoax, um, we just wanted to design um, and then um, congratulate the world on having had the better idea all along. We hoped to spread rumors that the world had changed, um, operating just as the right wing does with all of the guises but none of the disadvantages of truth. So it might not be entirely clear if this high speed rail line between uh, LA and Las Vegas, the Desert Express, or this high-speed rail line between LA, Vegas, and Phoenix is the real project. And, and it might seem strange to build a high-speed rail in the desert, but it actually makes absolute sense, given that um, uh, the 500-mile train journey trumps the same distance by air, given that it frequently costs more to build a runway, uh, than capa uh, runway capacity than a train line. This was Russ Maida and Tom Moran gathered this research. About BPL. And if you believe that, um, here was a project from my research about the ways in which the floor is becoming the most important architectural surface. It showed uh, new vehicles that are the mergers of cars, elevators, and automated guided vehicles. In the same way that, they el that an elevator was an active form that dictated most of our urban morphology, these devices have, I think, a tremendous capacity to generate uh, morphology, it, it, mostly because they alter uh, what constitutes navigable surface in architecture. They don't need shafts or roads or drivers. They go horizontally and vertically, and if anything, they favor the floor because they read the floor for instructions. My favorite one is this, is this one here, that it, it's like a giant roll of cellophane kind of coming towards you at 11 miles an hour. <laughs> and if you believe that, um, you might believe uh, this plan uh, to use the Amazon to bypass the Panama Canal and take down uh, oil and you know, lumber and so on uh, that's being uh, mined there. Um, and along the route in Ecuador, uh, the Yasuni Preserve is a particularly species abundant area that it's sitting on 20% of the country's oil. Um, but it's been the subject of a new global oil protocol. It's something like RED that you may know about, but it, it's not an offset for admissions. It actually sells certificates to the world in exchange for keeping its oil in the ground. Santiago del Hierro gathered this research. And of course, OPEC um, wants to buy certificates, you know, for obvious reasons.
And if you believe that, um, I, can, I can tell you uh, about some research I've been doing that indicates really clearly that uh, building subtraction as both a heavy industry and a design program protocol is an emergent global enterprise that's capable of making negative development profitable. So I think this, it, the removal of buildings is going to be an incredibly lucrative new uh, enterprise. Um, prompted by the financial crisis, uh, these emergent um, subtraction economies allow the building, the sort of physical outcropping of the real estate market, to approach the flexibility and volatility of the throbbing financial envelope that's, that's surrounding it. So I'm working on two active forms um, here. One is a marketplace for material recovery after subtraction, and the other is a, um, a new playbook for gaming space. And part of what I'm doing is simply putting together what already exists. As they work together, they position negative development as, as an aggressive, uh, lucrative industry. So I'm, I'm saying that the new flipper, the new quant, is making money from building removal. Um, and the glimmers of this emergent industry are, you know, not surprisingly, on HGTV, you've seen demo men. Um, and then, you know, where we always see it, of course, computer and iPhone apps. You know, somehow it has to already be obvious. Somehow it has to already be right in front of us all along to really seem, you know, outlandish. Um, but the material marketplace that I'm working on is a little bit like Yoink, which you've probably seen. It's a GPS-enabled version of ePay or Amazon or a little bit like Google Trader in Tanzania. It creates an online marketplace of sorts, except that in Yoink, you're giving things away. Um, but I'm working with Bonobo, the developers of Yoink, on a similar app that will trade, sell, handle spent construction materials. Actually, I noticed that somebody on Yoink is actually already doing this giving away, you know, lumber. And, um, but it's called Stream, and it works in a very similar way. So rather than engage with EPA's glacial reforms about material streams or engage in some uh, a quixotic effort to reform recycling, uh, the app just allows entrepreneurs to harvest materials, formerly known as waste, which are, are incredibly lucrative in the end. But none of the negative development I don't think would ever be you know, lucrative because of a material marketplace. Um, so really more powerful is a growing number of development protocols um, for site clearing that, and there's been a lot of it, right, um, that spatialize risk and property interdependence. So I've found a subtraction playbook, let's call it, that stabilizes uh, development investment by de deleting development. And I, I think it can be paired with the material marketplace. And what I mean by that is, um, well, you know how um, Oglethorpe's savanna grew by wards. So they were explicitly designed squares, but each time you built a square, it came with a quotient of rural space outside the city. So it would grow, it's an active form. Um, it would grow and you knew explicitly how it would grow, but you, would, you could never name it. You could never tell what its outline would be. Um, and the subtraction protocol I'm talking about, you can't, oh, I'm sorry that you can barely see, I don't know if you can see, um, the, ex, the spaces outside the, um, can you see it just vaguely? Can you, wait, I'll do it again. Can you see that there are spaces outside? Yeah, there are rural, there are rural spaces, so that's what, what happened in Savannah, but but what I'm talking about is one that works in the reverse of Savannah. Um, so the combination of demolition and densifying has always been profitable, but this playbook uses uh, the taxes uh, on increased profit from densification to purchase lots or buildings for deletion. And it allows those two sets of lots to have shares in each other's profits. Uh, profits from densification and profits from cleared land that might be doing things like, um, you know, either either getting profits from landscape or energy or utility business. 
Um, and it's intended for excessive spent development, but some of these interdependencies might also be applied to the more violent subtractions in sensitive sites. But it's, anyway, it shows how throwing the development engine in reverse can make of subtraction a form of growth. And it's in some ways completely obvious. Um, but the best way for me to illustrate it maybe is to show you this, um, this reverse game of Go that you may have seen um, called Takeaway. Uh, it's the reverse, reverse of Go because it, it values clearing rather than obstruction. Um, I don't know if any of you have played this. Can you see enough contrast there to see what's happening? Again, it's always already there, um, always all around us, uh, too close to see, native. Um, and as the layers of global infrastructure become more pal palpable, they tutor a political craft. The dispositional strata of infrastructure are politically powerful in that they can disappear and be discrepant, but they can also serve as the weather changing matrix changing medium that decides what survives. Active forms continually condition space with political intent. I mean, I think you could say they show us how to game space. And in this central and potent territory are underexplored, underexploited forms of polity that are imminent in the back channels of global infrastructure. Thank you. It's actually it's different. It, we're, while Enduring Innocence was a series of stories, um, this is asking, um, this is actually generating a contemplation first about, um, about disposition um, uh, and using, using um, about disposition and also about uh, um, the sort of dominant epistemes, the ways in which they provide, um, the ways in which the case studies provide contradiction to them. But it's structured, there's three parts, but it's the th three of the main stories are ISO, um, uh, uh, the Kenya story uh, and the zone story, but they're each of them a kind of tangle of infrastructure, not, not following any one network. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, um, when you were, uh, uh, you've invented this, um, this term active uh, form. Um, how does it relate to ideas um, of, say, system or, um, a, um, or I guess, a s like structure and and um, as in like structuralism or post structuralism as opposed to built structure? Um, is it is it Different than 
those, or is it a thing that you, which is kind of like them? And well, I, I, feel I just think that we, we, there are many forms of authorship that there's nothing new about this, but there's many forms of authorship which we, which are, are we don't enjoy as much as we might, um, and those are, uh, you know, you mentioned structure, system, but of course those things slide between many uh, things that we regard as site proper, but the pleasure in populations of those sites, the pleasure in components that travel, um, um, the, the pleasure in uh, remote toggles that alter something physically, but, but they, they're, they're not drawing our, our direct uh, shaping and contouring, but indirect shaping and contouring. I think those are really thrilling modes of authorship uh, with a completely different species of, of artistry, um, um, but e e equally uh, satisfying. Um, I think we do tend to think of them as, well, that's you know, construction and structure and system and so on, which is different, but um, I mean, it, as is obvious here, I'm, I'm using the way in which, you know, for instance, in theater, that's completely naturalized. That you you oper you oper you're make you're making action. You're not making uh, profile. Um, you love profile. Or you love text. You love words and the sound of them. But you you love making action with that too. Um, you're up to your elbows in action when you go to work. And that's a pleasure that. I think we do not take advantage of a seduction we do not uh, succumb to. You have no other questions. You don't even want to ask me what's true and what's false. Uh, how do you describe uh, the violence of construction in sensitive uh, size? Yeah. Um, how do you describe it? What I meant by that, and that was a, a sort of a, a, a glancing, too quick uh, comment, but I, I, I was um, trying to say that the, this form of subtraction that I was showing, um, I was trying to distance it from uh, forms of subtraction that we usually see, which have to do with clearing. Um, slum clearing, you know, the long history of the ways in which there are violent uh, economies of subtraction um, uh, around the world. Um, and this, while this protocol I'm talking about is aimed at kind of McMansion excesses, um, it, 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 I think there is something about the interdependency between um, uh, and, and sharing of risk, uh, an interdependency between properties that uh, could potentially be, be used in, in a reverse of the subtraction uh, protocol. So not DeSoto, right? Uh, not that, um, which uh, you know, has its own problems, just, just accelerates a number of problems. Not giving deeds, you know, but, but uh, creating dependencies. Um, could, could, could you feed an imagination with a, an idea like that, a political imagination? Do you take an ethical position on truth versus fiction, or fact versus spin, or does it matter really in your work? Um, like when you talk about right-wing tactics of kind of using obviously false facts to generate more interest than those false facts to generate some kind of interest. Like does it matter, is there an ethical kind of, um, is there still like, uh, an ethical desire with truth, or that does not matter. Well, it's not. I'm, I suppose it's not about sort of being uh, deliberately misleading in some kind of um, um, venal way, um, but but learning but learning the way in which um, uh, the sort of forthright position is at a di is at a disadvantage. Um, doesn't mean that one has has to lie, but. but being able to create forms that are that are fluid, that are mediagenic, that are traveling, um, is is much more powerful. Um, 
and then the right wing does that brilliantly. Um, coming up with different names for things, coming up with uh, a kind of spin. Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, your question is interesting because, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it, I, I'm trying to say that it's that, that, that certainty about principles that is, is not the ethical stance that I would want to take. Uh, it's the struggle with them is the, is the one uh, that I wouldn't want to take. 